everybody. Welcome to the Resistance Broadcast. I'm John. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Lacey and James with me, as always. And if you saw the title, which I assume you did, unless you're just like, TRB, gotta click, gotta kick, gotta go, gotta listen, gotta look. Uh, you know that we are interviewing the composer for Obi-Wan Kenobi, Natalie Holt. Uh, so that's going to be this episode. We had a great discussion with her. Uh, guys, without spoiling anything, uh, your, your, your takeaway from, from speaking with Natalie, what did you think? Because we've talked to other composers. We've talked to mm-hmm. a bunch of composers on this show. Yeah, she's super charming. And, I, and I, you can feel her excitement of working with Star Wars yeah, and yeah. being kind of working with John Williams and like being a part of that kind of Star Wars group. Um, you'll feel that throughout the interview. Mm-hmm. And I was excited too. There's, even though we've uh, interviewed other composers, there were a couple questions that I thought, I don't know why I've never asked this, you know, like a couple things that I've always really wanted to know and get like someone's take on it. And uh, so I was excited to be able to get the answers and um, I felt like she answered them very well too. Yeah, and there's there's a certain sense of humbleness and humility to her that I think applies to what Lacey was saying about her being charming is you feel like she's just this accessible person, but she's also just, you know, she's human. Super, in that uber, yeah. creatively a genius. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> it's always crazy to me sitting across virtually from uh, people like her or John Powell or something, like, because I don't even have that ability to think musically like that, so... It's just like speaking to like, I don't know. It's just amazing. It's always it's, wild yeah, it's a, too when you're yeah. watching, we, you know, like she's done more than just uh, uh, Star Wars stuff. Like she did Loki, for instance. It's like sure. I was watching that show and being like, man, this music's great. Not really putting necessarily putting two and two of like who did the score and stuff. But then to f- kind of get this interview and then lo- look back at it and be like, holy crap. <laughs> like if mm-hmm. I could tell the me that was listening to Loki, you know, for instance, uh Mm -hmm. what was happening yeah it's so crazy so cool yeah well check out check it out for yourselves here is our interview with natalie holt (laughs) natalie thank you so much for joining us welcome to the resistance broadcast we're honored to have you on the show hello (laughs) yay (laughs) so obviously that you know you're you're a part of this huge massive show um you know, I'm sure it's been a whirlwind for you. Uh, now, now that we've worked with both Marvel and Lucasfilm, what would you say the biggest difference is between working with each studio as a composer? Oh, <laughs> um, oh, I don't know. Oh, I suppose, um, just for me personally, it was it was like a, just a big time difference because, um. I got Loki kind of uh, like they were still shooting and then there was lockdown. And so we had all this extra time in the middle to develop um, a suite. So then when they went back to shoot again after the lockdown, um, like Tom was playing the Loki theme as he walked out on set and stuff. Um, (laughs) What a great moment. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, And so my, yeah. And I just, I got kind of had, had, like a year on Loki and then um Obi Obi I had like three and a half months so really I don't know like both companies they're so different and and I think the tone is um very different like they don't want that like sometimes I would write a cue <laughs> I was always told like no this is this is too kind of funny or whatever like I think there's a more serious um well certainly Loki's kind of a comedy villain and, sure, and sure. Obi this this felt like a very emotional project as well because he's kind of lost in the desert so for me it was just like a tonal a real tonal shift between those those two characters as well they just they feel like very different like creatures in in, in terms of my approach nice well from the dark intense inquis- inquisitor's hunt to like the more hopeful, energetic young Leia, you do kind of touch on those two different kind of modes, would you say? Uh, do you have more enjoyment in different energies or different kind of emotional states? Or is it just like you like creating in all different ways? Um, I think 
because I'm well actually do you know what like, you've got all your Star Wars things behind you I've got my violin on the floor yes like, I, was <laughs> I was practicing the violin today for the like first time I I'm I'm a violinist um uh, before I kind of got into the composing so I think that kind of like emotional haunting string writing like um where Nari was hung and and where um Tala dies like those those violin solo things feel like quite in my ballpark because I'm a violinist I guess and and so it was quite fun to be able to go to those like really emotional places and you know like um so you enjoy making us cry is basically yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? Yeah, enjoy is the wrong word, but it's like it's a place that I can access and and right. mm-hmm. like I've played all that kind of emotional string repertoire and it it's just in the back of my head, I suppose. And yeah. I love that. I I've always been curious about this, if you don't mind answering this. Can you sort of walk us through the process of how the music is created versus it, versus how it ends up in the show? Like, I imagine you obviously create the music for a particular moment, but as the final edit of the show cuts between multiple scenes, how does that final track end up with, with the different merged music? How does that end up becoming a thing uh, as opposed to like what show up what shows up on the soundtrack, which is each scene as its own finished version? Well, so, I mean, um, when I watched through, I, so Deborah Chow, when I got the job, Deborah flew to London and we watched through episodes one to four were pretty much like intact, almost as you saw them, except, you know, they were missing all the, all the um, special effects, but there wasn't too many changing around. There was like the odd scene that had sort of frames chopped and things. And, oh, there was some big set pieces that changed, but the overall structure kind of remained fairly intact because because everyone's doing all the all the CGI and everything, um, all the visual effects. So I think they're kind of locked in at a certain point to keep things quite set. So, um, but f- five and six definitely changed a lot. Um, hmm. But then, so I'll be scoring, I'll be watching it, and I'll have it play, and I'll chunk it into into scenes and and I'll be writing and making sure I'm hitting certain points in the scene. And then um, you'll get every week we would get different edits coming through. And then at a certain point you stop and then you record using that version. And then you record to that and the music editor then takes over to kind of cut things together if things are changing anymore. And that was um, Nick Fitzgerald. So those yeah. fine tweakings to make sure everything's just bang on um, is in the editor's ha- music editor's hands right at the end. And they'll be in the dub, just, you know, making sure everything's staying put. If that, God, that's a really long, boring answer for you. <laughs> no, I, no love it. Uh, yeah, I, oh. I would have you go on forever. Yeah. I'm just interested how those changes happen between the different musical pieces. And if it, if it's not working musically, is there like another version that has to be made or something? Oh yeah. Or... Oh my gosh. We do some things like the, the layer, um, theme i mean i think and older on i think i got into like version 17 so i don't wow. you know that's the thing because i'll play things like we'd have a review and and then things would get sent off to kathleen kennedy for those big you know like the inquisitors and leia yeah. and um reva like she wanted to to kind of keep an eye on on the on the character themes so those would all be uh. You know, you'd get notes like the Princess Leia theme that I wrote first off was too um, like Disney princess. They said it was because I used like a flute <laughs> and I wanted to tie oh, it together with her adult theme. And yeah. I was using like a, a folk uh, instrument, like a, a sort of elementary. I thought, oh, it'd be kind of fun to play around with it. But it was like, no, it needs to be sassy and, and have loads of energy and be bigger. And so. Um, yeah, that layer theme like was many many goes to get it to the correct version. Wow! So that it worked out. So, yeah. That sort of predictively answers my next question in a way because I I did my homework and I've seen you mention in, in previous interviews that your mom was a music teacher <laughs> and that you had access to all sorts of instruments, specifically cellos and pianos, growing up, and it seemed like this sort of. Um, you know, use your imagination, open palette, clean slate, uh, just play and, 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 and 
and enjoy music and find music. How has that upbringing influenced your style of composing music? It's, but also when you juxtapose it against what you were just saying, which is doing music in potentially high pressure situations for major studios. <laughs> I don't think mo I don't think much prepares you for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess um, I've always been really interested in going to concerts and like hearing unusual instruments and and being inspired by specific players because um, like I managed to get James Innes to come and play for me on this. The, violinist soloist who I've just been a fan of for years and um he's he's just got such an incredible sound and he came and led the orchestra for the day and then he did the Nari hanging solo and the Tala death solo as well so I was just yeah I love I love kind of getting to work with with musicians that inspire me as well and um just bringing bringing people like the, um Ali Moller who's the um Swedish flautist who has this huge collection of unusual um flutes and and wind instruments and so I, he he had this huge collection and he was just playing things to me because I wanted to find something for Leia and then he picked up this huge drone flute and I was like oh that's that's gonna work for Vader and so um wow. he had this hunting horn and he played it and it was just, it sounded like so tribal and, you know, it kind of gets you in your guts. And I was just thinking, oh, that's perfect for Vader. So weirdly stumbled across that instrument. But yeah, it's just like having these unusual colors. I really like to to do that. I, and I think um, Ludwig does that quite a bit as well with going on yes. trips, and just being, inspiring yourself, like taking field trips and recording unusual instruments. Oh, wow. That's fantastic, because that's also like how Ben Burton people would create the original sound effects for Star Wars are just going for a hike and banging sticks on things and stuff. So that's really mm -hmm. cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So I, I love hearing that uh, you talking about all these other people that inspire you. Now, I might be in it might be in my brain right now because ready to go to me when I was re-listening to the soundtrack sounds like Stranger Things a little bit. But Stranger Things is like in the current pop culture space right now. <laughs> um, but are there any... Uh, TV shows or movies that you've heard in the past year or two that you're like, wow, this is amazing. And it has just like been that kind of inspirational, like this is really stuck with me. Um, I definitely just such a big fan of The Mandalorian. I thought I really love that. Um, you know, I was kind of thinking, gosh, how can someone come and do Star Wars? Like, unless it's John Williams or John Powell that, you know, like in that zone and, and then hearing what he did for the Mandalorian, I was just like, like those recorders and um, yeah, I just thought that's definitely really inspired me. Um, and now you're and here I'm and now we're having this conversation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're in that list now. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> um, who else? I really like um, Christabel Tapia de Vere's score for White Lotus. I don't know if you heard that. Oh, yeah. I definitely have to check it out. Show. Yeah. Yeah, that was really cool. He's a, he's yes. a composer. Yeah, I don't know, but I tend to listen to lots of um, like classical music as well and just other things other than film music. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Right, of course. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Well, yeah, let me, let me bounce off that a little bit because as you're talking about all these different composers from different shows and things, it's this kind of an ongoing question. I've always kind of wondered what, you know, someone like you would have the opinion on. Uh, it's been said that if an audience member is noticing the music in a movie or TV show, that the music is then too abrupt, meaning like the music of a film or TV's project's job is only to emphasize a scene sort of like in the background. Do you, do you think that's true? Or, um, you know, can you give any examples of maybe one way or the other, whichever supports your thoughts? Yeah, so I definitely think John Williams' music like sits above the movie and, and and it does bring attention to itself and and it but it but it sort of complements what you're watching in such a way it's like an extra character in the film like i think et or jaws you know you you just can't imagine those movies without mm -hmm. that character of the score um and i think that's probably like a a more um like something that we used to 
what's the word? I don't want to say old fashioned, but it, it kind of is. I think it's it's something that we used to do in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And then we got to a certain point where I think um, it, the, the tastes really changed. And it's more usual to hear just, I think what you're saying is then became like pe people didn't want the music to draw attention to itself. They wanted yes. it to just kind of sit in the background. And there was there was a trend for ages for music to be almost unobservable, but just ticking along. And and you know, I think people didn't want melodies that that stuck them stuck out too much. And I think we're reaching a really interesting place where those two things are coming together. And I I, I was talking to a director about this the other day, like how when you don't notice the score, it can sometimes be almost adding an, a layer unconsciously. To, so it's kind of like operating on a level here, like a synth, like a really rumbling down low can mm -hmm. add a load of tension to a scene that, but that you don't really notice it. So it's almost like psychologically adding a layer of storytelling narrative. But then I think it's really interesting when you when you do draw attention to yourself and you add a theme and you, you know, like, I guess the Loki theme, I was trying to do something that was just like, when you see Loki and you hear this thing, it, it ties together with his character and it does draw attention oh, yeah. to itself um so it's i think it's i don't know i personally find it interesting to play around with with both of those like the more unnoticeable psychological music plus the more thematic yeah, yeah. so music music is coming back in fashion but it depends on the situation i like it i like it i don't know that's my own weird <laughs> <laughs> idea <laughs> Well, you, you mentioned Darth Vader before, and arguably the most iconic character in cinema history. Many would make that argument. Our audience certainly would as Star Wars fans. Um, so when, when it comes to, like, I guess, can you try to explain the pressure or the process and experience of writing new music for a character that already has, like, you know, the Imperial March and, like, these established things over decades? Uh, that accompanied scenes in this series and are, are there any sequences you made that stand out to you you mentioned the tribal beats and stuff like that so for what you were able to apply for Darth Vader in this series um, can you touch on on that experience a bit and what that was like and, and your takeaways yeah sure so um I guess if you like I said in interviews that we didn't know if John was going to approve his um, use of his themes when I first got the project so we had like a month or so where Deborah was kind of saying, I don't want to get attached to the idea of using these heritage themes because we haven't been told we can use them yet. And so I think we should oh, do okay. our own thing. Um, and so, and then, I don't know, January kind of time, John watched the series and agreed. He was like, I want to write Benny a theme. And then, so he was on board and because he was on board, then he allowed us to kind of use his themes in episode six. Um, so Deborah wanted to kind of build up to the use of those themes. Um, so she, she felt like Vader wasn't Vader yet. Like he's this fury rage version of Vader. Like he hasn't controlled his anger at all. He's just, you know, he's still a bit Anakin and, and he's, we don't in, in an episode six where he says, you didn't kill Anakin, I did. And then, then you hear the Imperial March and it's like, it's paid off through the whole series to that point. And that was Deborah Chow's um, idea. But um, so I did use the melody, the rhythm, ry rhythmic, like dun, 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 mm -hmm. dun, underneath the Vader theme. So it was, it, it was there, but, but the theme was kind of more, rage and anger and this kind of swirling tension and um the hunting horn the low cellos like slowed down so you can like hear the strings like scraping on the strings and stuff and big brass section just like hopefully kind of creating this swirling vortex of rage <laughs> oh it did it felt like a it felt like a horror movie seeing him and with that with that music that accompanied him it felt like michael myers or something walking down the street yeah. so you and and the fact that you're confirming you basically told the story with the music to build to that point is what i i'm so glad to hear that so that's awesome 
So speaking of characters, because Darth Vader is like one of the greatest characters of all time, is there any other Star Wars characters that you would love to write a theme for or not Star Wars? Is there any just characters in general that you're like, oh, if I could just write a theme for them, it would be epic? I think um, because I think John Williams has done such a brilliant job. Mm -hmm. Like his like the Ray theme. I just think it's so gorgeous. That's my favorite. Yeah. So no, I don't think any Star Wars characters like Ludwig's like nailed the Mandalorian and <laughs> and John Williams has done an incredible job <laughs> on all for all my favorite characters. So um yeah, I think and I I don't know, I guess it depends what my career brings me. Like I feel like so lucky I got to give Loki a theme and um I don't know, yeah, hopefully a new character that's not in existence yet that I, I i'm a new project in the future that would be cool to like just make your own theme for a brand new character that has no kind of history with it you know like people aren't expecting anything which makes it even more cool awesome yeah <laughs> yeah um i have a question for you is now we're talking about john williams here every once in a while he traditionally he's sort of been the example for star wars music right um, but taking a note from J.J. Abrams, who said Ryan Johnson did things he didn't think were allowed in Star Wars, and therefore that opened the door for him doing new things in Episode Nine. Uh, have any of the composers uh, before you, like Jorgensen, Powell, uh, Giacchino, uh, the Kiners, even, um, you know, get, have they given you any liberty to do something that maybe you didn't think w- would have been possible in traditional Star Wars music? I guess so. I mean, I think that definitely the the score that we've ended up with in Obi is is a blend of like more emotional, um, like a bit more spare than than star than traditional Star Wars music, but um hopefully complementing what John Williams had done. Um and that balance was just very finely like, you know, working with with um Bill Ross, who's been um on John Williams's kind of mm-hmm. team for many years and you know everyone and Kathleen Kennedy like listened through to everything so it felt very much like everyone wanted to be really respectful of John and the heritage and um you know make sure that the score was the per- the right blend of the old and the new and um so yeah that that it was very kind of i guess i was i felt like the whole process was was overseen by people that I trusted knew you know what it should the right level for it and um and I was just guided by Deborah Chow and um and yeah like I I think when you hear Powell and and you know I I spoke I was lucky enough to speak to him actually when I was in LA recording I met him at the um, SCL awards and so that was really nice like I got to chat to him and I got to chat to Ludwig and just you know like John was so supportive he just said like it's just feels really overwhelming like when you land that Star Wars job and you just think oh my gosh it's Star Wars and you feel frozen like and and so it was nice I was like oh my gosh if I can't believe if John Powell feels like that then like what am I doing you're normal you're okay (laughs) but he was really sweet he was like just reach out if you you know if I can help you and you know Oh, that's amazing. he's a lovely lovely guy and um and so is Ludwig and I was working with um Ludwig's engineer who Chris Fogel who engineered the Mandalorian soundtrack so mm-hmm. that was really cool and and again oh, cool. like another big figure who's who's overseen um that kind of sound and and mm-hmm. he was helping me and he's based in Ludwig's studio complex so yeah, it just felt like a really nice because I'm I'm obviously based in London and I was like in LA working, so it was great to have that kind of support network there. Yeah, we're really crossing chance? off Star Wars composers. I mean, right. we've had uh, John Powell on the show. Um, we've had Ryan yeah. Shore on the show. We've had Kevin Kiner on the show. Like, it's always interesting to hear the different perspectives uh, as they as they come along and say, "This is how I tackled it," you know, a little bit different. And yeah, great answer. Yeah, that's very cool. Now, you know, you've already done big stuff. I mean, Marvel, Star Wars, and, you know, we've seen for the first time, it was, you know, Ludwig Gorenson doing uh, 
abstract type of Star Wars music when we've been using, you know, the John Williams, John Powell, Giacchino stuff, which is in that pocket. Um, but Ludwig came back and then he got, you know, a warm reception to his music, came back to do season two. Uh, it's been very publicly revealed by Kathleen Kennedy that they're exploring more Kenobi. Um, would you have interest in coming back to doing a second season of Kenobi if they go forward with that? Or are you, I did the Star Wars, let's see what's else. Like, where, where where's your mindset? Um, with with going forward if they move forward with more Kenobi yeah I don't I don't know I mean um I'd love to but like obviously um I don't know like I I spoke to Deborah and and she very much feels that that it's a sort of completed story right um and I think Ewan just is, loves playing the character <laughs> yes he does <laughs> Deborah was saying that you know he's he's just like so so in love with being Obi and he doesn't he wants to do it again so yeah I, I don't know but I I really enjoyed it and and loved the to the team there and um you know when you grow up as a kid watching it as well it, and and also my daughter um just is a big Star Wars fan like we watched the whole everything we, we before I knew that I was going to be working on it um my daughter and I watched Star Wars together like in chronological order which i'd never done before um oh, wow. and, oh nice. like everything um so she's just like huge into it and you know she loves anakin skywalker i think because she's <laughs> funny when you're that eight and you see the pod racing and you yeah. see, oh yeah it's like she's she just when he you know she's like can't believe what's happened to him she's really upset oh him. that's brutal <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> oh Oh, oh! Did she get to return the Jedi yet? Because there's a happy ending. For yeah, her, so. yeah, she <laughs> has seen that. She was. I think it's just just a bit kind of hard to piece together the different actors, though, isn't it? I guess when you're at that age, right? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Even today, I'm like, wait, who's that guy? <laughs> who's that? <laughs> so being in a creative role can be super challenging for someone like you, someone like us. Is there anything that you do to help you get into that mindset to create? Is there anything you have to have, like a cup of tea, or is there anything that you must do? Um, I mean, that's the thing. Like the thing that I find really challenging is just the actual kind of creative coming up with stuff. It's like, um, I find it so difficult to, you know, like you'll have an idea and you're not sure if it's good yet and it's so painful that's the most painful part mm -hmm. is just like having an idea and like knowing that you need to crack this theme and that you haven't like oh no that doesn't work and you go away from it and come back and and then when you crack it it's just like oh the best <laughs> feeling <laughs> and then people like it like yes this is it it's like die you i mean god the that um i don't know how many versions of I did for the Dayu planet just finding the right like instruments and I was kind of doing Indonesian gamelan and and Deborah was like no it's not impactful enough like when you see the wide shot of Dayu it needs to be like an assault on the senses and so I did many versions of that and then when I came up with that 5-4 rhythm that's like driving it's like taking Obi through the planet and it's like yes this feels like Dayu finally but um oh, man. and it's funny because sometimes the director you know you think you've cracked it and you present it and then the director's like no this isn't what I imagined and that was one where I was like I'm glad Deborah pushed me on that because I feel like we got to the right like she she was right like it what what yeah. we ended up with really worked I think <laughs> do you have a folder of songs and stuff that you've come up with that you're just like I'll save these for another time like I'll save these for another project <laughs> I don't know. I know some composers that say that. They're yeah. like, oh, you can put it in your, you know, I think they, I, I never, I don't know. I never go back to those folders. I think I just, once they're not in use, I'm like, I did, I'm, I'm always trying to come up with something new that it mm -hmm. suits the project. Good for you. Um, That's awesome. That's really cool. And I have to say, as someone that does like a lot of video and graphic design stuff, I have like version 20 of things. <laughs> I have version like, oh, yeah. so uh, I, yeah. I feel that. <laughs> <laughs> um so i'm gonna hit you with the hardest question for last uh which means it's not but <laughs> okay. um have you because i think we've all like everyone is creative in their own way have you ever thought of a music sequence 
like in your mind or whether it's you're going to sleep at night or whenever and it's bopping around your head and it keeps coming back to you and you're about to like like oh, i'm gonna put this in this thing and then you realize it's something you had already done in another piece or it's something someone you like did and you subconsciously like took it and you're like oh that's that thing has that ever happened to you it's happened to me i wrote this it was really weird i wrote this thing and i i was convinced it was like a piano piece and i played it and i was like oh this is great and it and it wasn't like it was it was like a year later because i remembered that piano piece that i played and it was <laughs> it was in some it was in a tv series um and then i heard it was like a really obscure piano piece in out of africa <laughs> oh wow like oh my god that is just like so similar like it was really weird like I was like really freaked out because it was like all the same chords and I was like I don't, wow, wow. I don't remember I mean I must have watched out of Africa when I was about 13 <laughs> I just I don't remember I don't really remember I mean I can remember the main theme from it but it was just like oh my god what if my brain like sucks music in and just that's not good enough <laughs> Anyway, that was a weird moment. It was on one of those like cl um, classical music shows on the radio, because and I was like, oh, "What's? The <laughs> I thought I'd written that." <laughs> that's that's, uh, that's scary. Like, I, I, yeah. you know, always afraid that you're going to put out something and nobody's going to catch it, and everybody's going to be like, "Did they not realize that's Harry Potter <laughs> or something?" And it's like, "Oh my god, it is." <laughs> we <laughs> had no clue. God, yeah. <laughs> And out of Africa is such like a, a sweeping, powerful. No, it wasn't. It was like a theme. secondary. It really was. It wasn't like the main theme. For, it was like. Oh, all right. Well, well either way. Piano piece. It was. It, and <laughs> that was what was. Begun. Well, I, I I guess the last thing for me is how does it feel knowing that you're built alongside John Williams? Because I, I saw that you had mentioned E.T. is what launched you into loving film music. So how does it feel now that you're done with the work? You can enjoy the fruits of your labor and your name is built alongside John Williams. What's that like? Uh, to, what is that? <laughs> like, I, yeah, like very surreal. And I still can't believe it. Like, I'm glad they because when I met him, um, I, I sort of had warning that it was going to happen. And, and like, I managed to prepare myself for it because I, I would need to be prepared that. too. Like, how do you prepare? <laughs> I was like, oh, my, I literally feel like I would have just cried. I'd, just, I'd have just been like, oh my gosh. Because it, it's like, he's such an important figure and in, in just like, from and like his music's so incredible. And um. Yeah, and and he's just so lovely as well. So it was it was very overwhelming to meet him, but but really really special. And yeah, glad it happened. Well, is there any chance you know celebrations next year in London? Is there any chance you're going to attend? Because we'd love to uh, hopefully see you there. Yeah, you I would continue definitely. Continue Star Wars or not? But I yeah, to go. Yeah, there was. I I went to the celebration in Anaheim, and I just couldn't believe there was like a whole section. Where you can get tattoos. I was like, wow, I can't, yeah. I can't believe there's this many people who are going to come and get tattoos today. I was impressed with that. <laughs> have, have any of you got them? I do not have any tattoos. I understand no it though. Tattoos. If you're going to get it, you'll always remember that you got it at Star Wars Celebration. You know, it was you went there. It wasn't just like your local place. You like it was on a destination. I got it when I was on vacation, sort of thing. So it kind of made sense to me when I when I saw it. I was like, oh yeah, but they'll always remember where they got it too. Did you get one, Natalie? No. <laughs> <laughs> Music by Natalie Holt on your wrist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I, I know we're pretty much up on time. So uh, I just want to say thank you so much. This was a, a real joy. We could have went on for, for way longer, but uh, I know you have a lot of other interviews to get to and stuff like that. But I just want to say thank you so much for joining us on the, the Resistance broadcast and uh, if we get a chance to chat with you down the line, uh, you have a key to the resistance base because this was an absolute blast. Thank oh, you so thank much. Thank you. Well, yeah, see you in London. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. Thanks, Natalie. Great. Bye. Lovely to meet you. Bye. 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 <laughs> so there you have it. We hope you enjoyed that interview with Natalie Holt. Uh, we told you it was awesome. Uh, we loved everything about her answers and you know there were some things that helped me inform my appreciation for obi-wan kenobi for sure because early on i was uncertain about the music and now 
hearing her explanation of sort of the progressive journey they wanted to take with the music uh, to tell the same story that the um, plot itself was, uh, was pretty fulfilling. And mm -hmm. uh, just everything that she had to say about her relationship with Deborah Chow and, and all that stuff was just everything I wanted to hear because we, it was almost like we got a behind the curtains look at the collaboration. Like every time she mentioned Deborah Chow and her pushing back on her ideas and stuff, you really felt there like them working almost like we mm -hmm. went back in time and like we was observing them working i don't know like before we get out of here guys uh what what uh what do you think go I ahead mean, james well yeah just initially like this is a good opportunity to even talk about the kenobi score like we barely touched on it when we were doing our kenobi uh like live stuff um and it and john you're exactly right that like i think a lot of us were kind of not sure about the Kenobi score because in my opinion, it's because it wasn't as like in your face as um, Ludwig right. has been. Those to me felt like pop songs. They were immediately singable um, after just like one or two episodes. You're like, that is it, it stuck in my head. It took five or six episodes for a lot of those themes to really start resonating. Um, with the score, but that's the thing. Um, I don't know. That's the thing about the, the star Wars music. Like I, I love being able to recognize it and, and hear it pop out in other uh, projects as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lacey, any uh, final thoughts before we hop out of here? I just liked how you could just tell the, like how much this means to her and how every, Oh yeah. How every project that she works on is important to her and um just kind of that childlike exploration she has for music and and for finding new sounds that you see in other spaces in Star Wars like what was discussed but then also like what we've learned from Ludwig is like basically the same thing. It's like, "Oh, let me try this. Let me try that." And it's Again, she's on like another level of intelligence that I'll never reach um, of like creativity and, and just genius. Um, and it's just interesting to hear her talk about things that I wouldn't even comprehend um, through her eyes. Like, it's just so interesting. So I'm just grateful to have opportunities like this to talk to her. Yeah. And I, I correct me if I'm wrong. And, you know, we didn't mention this in in, in the interview and maybe... It doesn't need to be mentioned, but I, I'm pretty sure she's the first woman Star Wars she composer. Is. Yeah, she is. Yeah. Um, which you know, again, you know, that's pressure in in itself. That it seems like she was put her she put in an environment, and then also just her self assurance of her talent and abilities and her resume that it doesn't even come up. It's a non issue. It's just like she's the next Star Wars composer, and that's really mm -hmm. that's really cool to me. Um, but. A, a great chat. I wish we could have kept talking to her. I'm sure our audience is yeah. like, why'd you guys only do, you know, it's because she's busy. All right. She gave us time <laughs> to, to talk to her. So that's, that was, that was really great. So um, we're about to get out of here, but I just want to say thanks to Val uh, at Star Wars News Net um, for trusting us with um, handling this interview. And thanks to, of course, Natalie Holt and her entire team for taking the time. Uh, she's on London time. So it was uh, pretty late on her end there and uh you couldn't tell though because she was so engaging and wonderful so thank you again natalie and uh the entire team um make sure you do subscribe to the show you can do that on any audio platform whether that's spotify apple podcasts whatever you prefer soundcloud uh, of course if you're watching subscribe to our channel uh we may have just passed 8,000 subscribers so thank you everybody if not please do subscribe youtube.com slash star wars news net videos uh, and a special thank you to our uh, patrons at patreon.com slash resistance broadcast. If you like what we do here, we do a lot of other stuff on Patreon. But if you just want to support what we do, tier start at $2 a month. So go to patreon.com slash resistance broadcast and sign up. And I have to give a special shout out to our generals and spice runners, our top tiers on Patreon. Carmelo, John Reese, Jetta Rosewater, Paul Olson, Frank Grande, Darth Hurricane, John Charlton, Nick Kratz, Christian Morales, Brian Smith, Matt Chitty. Danny, Mike Ramori, Matt Heath, Chris White, Brendan McLaughlin, Count Pepto, Samuel Zilk, and Val Trichkoff. And our Spice Runners, David Probus, Neil Shaw, Kendall Gellner, Ryan Warr, David Hornack, Micah Harrison, Thomas Hennessy, Andrew Staley, and Jeremy Myers. Thank you all for all of your support. And make sure you are going to StarWarsNewsNet.com for all of your Star Wars news, reviews, editorials, information, and more. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Johnny Hoey, writing and editing at StarWarsNewsNet.com. 
James? If anybody wants to talk to me, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram, both at Myra Trunks. And Lacey. People can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Lacey Gillerin. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, good to be back with you on Thursdays. And, and what a way for us to do it, right? So we're back on our normal rotation until Andor comes out. So we'll see you on Monday morning with another episode right here on the Resistance Broadcast. See you around, kids. <laughs>